For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. Today we are joined by Mahjoub Maliha, who is from the Sahrawi Human Rights Defenders in Western Sahara, Kodesa. He is here to speak with us about the current situation in Western Sahara, what has happened since the ceasefire was broken by Morocco, and what are the perspectives for the future. Thank you so much for joining us, Mahjoub. So first we wanted to ask, what happened on November 13th, 2020, and what has happened since the ceasefire was broken by Morocco? Well, indeed, on 13 November 2020, the Moroccan occupying forces decided to annex extra territories from the buffer zone south of Western Sahara, an area called Gergarat, and breached the ceasefire that was signed back in 1991. This is a declaration of the end of the ceasefire. Uh, the Polisario Front, which is the legal representative of the Sahrawi people, took its responsibility and actually forced to take arms in, in, in uh, armed resistance against the occupation in Western Sahara. After that, uh, the Moroccan occupying forces intensified its uh, imposed siege on, on the Sahrawi uh, cities in the Kapai territories, uh, targeting the Sahrawi civilians who spoke a raised voice against the occupation uh, in Western Sahara, those who support the Polisario Front in the Occupy territories, and mainly targeting the human rights defenders who basically report on the grave human rights violations and crimes against humanity committed by the Moroccan occupying forces. We see that uh, uh, the military presence in the streets of the cities in Western Sahara have been have been increased. Uh, many uh, activists are put under under siege, under house arrest, temporarily or permanently, as the case of the uh, Sahrawi activists Sultana Khaya, Wa'ra Khaya, and their family, who are now uh, since 20 November last year are under house arrest till today facing daily oppressions, daily harassment from Moroccan occupying forces. Uh, we uh, have raised many reports uh, warning the international community of the, situ the human rights situation in Western Sahara, uh, a, a territory that is still closed uh, uh, and, and it, uh, I mean, on international observers have no access to, to the territory in Western Sahara, including the UN personnel. Uh, we have a, a, a UN mission, which is the MINORSO, uh, the UN mission for the referendum in Western Sahara that was created uh, upon the ceasefire agreement in 1991. And this mission is the only one in the world that has no human rights mandate. They have no right to monitor, report on the human rights situation on the ground, which leave the Sahrawi civilians, the human rights activists and, and defenders uh, facing the brutality of the occupation without, without any kind of protection or any kind of monitoring. We know that Morocco's actions on November 13th, 2020 and since then were also inspired by a shift in the geopolitical situation in the region. Uh, former U.S. President Donald Trump helped push forward some agreements that gave Morocco more support in exchange for normalizing ties with Israel. Can you talk about the role of the United States in the situation in Western Sahara and what it means today? previous U.S. administration have brokered uh, the Abraham Accord, as, as it's called, um, or the deal of the century. Uh, we see it as a trade deal, uh, not necessarily a political deal that, that respects uh, the people's wishes. Uh, Morocco indeed had or needed um, support from an international, uh, from the international community or from a country with the weight of the United States. Trump was leaving office just before that, a few weeks before that, um, gave uh, a proclamation to Morocco recognizing uh, recognizing sovereignty of Morocco over Western Sahara in a full contradiction with international law and in violation with the main fundamental principles of the United States itself and the United Nations, which is the right to self-determination. As part of this deal, uh, uh, actually doesn't change anything on the ground, doesn't change anything on the legal status of Western Sahara, which is uh, uh, reaffirmed recently, or uh, two weeks ago, by the highest court in the EU, the European Union, that, that have basically uh, annulled uh, association agreement, free trade agreement, and fisheries agreement between the European Union and Morocco that illegally includes Western Sahara. The court 
highlighted that Western Sahara and Morocco are distinct and separate territories. Morocco has no sovereignty over Western Sahara, so EU Morocco agreements have uh, cannot be applic uh, applied or applicable to Western Sahara. And beside that, for the first time in a clear tone from the judges from the highest court in the EU says that the Polisario Front is the legal representative of the Sahrawi people as recognized by international community and the United Nations and it has the legal personality to defend the interests of the people of Western Sahara. Back to the proclamation, indeed, uh, it came after the breach of the ceasefire. This proclamation, unfortunately, had a severe impact on the situation on the ground. The Moroccan occupying forces took it as a green light to commit and continue committing crimes against humanity, grave violations, of grave human rights violations, and targeting the Sahrawi civilians and the Sahrawi human rights defenders. This is this is the only uh, uh, impact that that this proclamation had. It will not change that the people of Western Sahara has a fundamental right to self-determination. It will not change that Western Sahara is a separate country and separate territory awaiting decolonization. It is still under the fourth committee, the decolonization committee on the UN. It is still uh, is still considered as a non-self-governing non territory awaiting the decolonization process. And we know that Beyond the role of the United States, of Donald Trump, of the Abraham Accords, of the deal of the century, there are also other interests at play. The, the European Union has interest in Western Sahara. Morocco has, of course, historically had interest in Western Sahara, but for a deeper reason, which has to do with its natural resources. Can you talk about this, uh, the natural resources that are located in Western Sahara as a root cause of the current conflict and how that has played in the situation today? Western Sahara is, is, is a rich territory uh, with natural resources, um, phosphate uh, for instance, uh, large stock of fisheries, um, potential oil and gas, and the renewable energy, the wind energy and the solar energy, beside other, other uh, uh, minerals uh, with value in the territory. Uh, those are basically the main reason Western Sahara was colonized by Spain and it is and remains the main reason the occupation continues from the Moroccan occupation or occupiers. Morocco to sustain its military occupation and gain not necessarily the international support but to, to maintain uh, the silence on the international level using this, these uh, natural resources to, to bribe uh, uh, the international community or major players in, in, in the international community, including the European Union. We see the fisheries agreement uh, and the trade agreements and uh, uh, many other uh, economical uh, um, contracts or treaties that, that are, or, or licenses given to major companies to, to, to buy their political support. This will not, will not of course, uh, will not be respect with international law, uh, but it is, uh, it is uh, surprising to see uh, countries like the United States, the European Union, who claim to be defenders of international law, creators of democracy, and defenders of human rights, they all fail and contradict themselves when it comes to Western Sahara just because they have strategic interest in the region or in the territory itself. Uh, we don't necessarily disagree on guaranteeing interests of those uh, countries and mainly the, the, their peoples. Uh, we, we are open to have co collaborations, cooperations with those countries for the interest of, of their people, but not, uh, not uh, against the interest of our people. Uh, there should be a mutual, a mutual understanding, a mutual agreement that benefit both parties. And of course we are uh, a nation that's still under occupation uh, and we of course, we can benefit. We can benefit in building our country and building our state from those partners. 
partnership should be should be an equal an equal ground. The breaking of the ceasefire uh, between Western Sahara and Morocco was seen as a huge setback. Uh, you mentioned the rampant human rights violations that have occurred. Can you talk about what are the perspectives for peace in the region and what does this mean to the Sahrawi people? Uh, peace, uh, peace in Western Sahara uh, lasted 30 years, almost 30 years, uh, with, with no progress. Um, and we need to highlight that the Sahrawi people, by nature, is a peaceful people. Um, to wait 30 years, it's, you need to be patient enough to, to, to keep believing in peace. But, but we see that there is no will from the international community, and mainly the Security Council and, and some of the member states, uh, there is no will to maintain peace in the territory. And we have warned uh, a decade ago and, 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 and every year that follows, uh, warned from, from, from uh, violence, uh, from lo loss of faith in peace among, among our youth and among other generations of our people. And here we are now, everyone is shouting uh, against peace and shouting for the armed resistance. And we don't think that is a healthy thing to have, but, but we are not responsible for that, for that outcome. It is the failure of the United Nations, the failure of the international community to guarantee peace and to guarantee a peaceful resolution and, uh, 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 and a completion of a decolonization process in Western Sahara.